today I want to talk about responsive, adaptive, and responsible. And uh, I, I, I thought it was a JavaScript conference, but I didn't want to go into details because there's other talks getting into details. And I just want to talk about how the changes that are happening right now in the web are affecting us and how they can be overwhelming and how they should not be because we're all actually happy lucky people that have great jobs. This is a picture from Sweden in 19-something, 74 or something like that, when they changed from driving on the left side of the road to the right side of the road, and the whole city was basically a mess. And people were just not knowing what they were doing, and it's like, it's like driving in Seattle on the motorway, it's the same thing there still. But it's just people don't like change too much, and especially when it's a change that, that breaks their, uh, their body, um, their, their memory, their muscle memory. Like, I'm on the wrong side of the road all of a sudden, what's going on here? I think. Uh, one of the things that I, that I like is, is inspiring lyrics, and one of those that I think we're living in dangerous times because if we're looking at more and more new things, our old dreams of the web actually might go away. And I think that's a terrible thing because the internet is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I traveled the world, really, literally, I was in like 27 countries last year, and I see people in Africa, I see people in India and Bangladesh having a voice on the world and learning. They don't have schools that they can attend during the day, but they can watch things on YouTube, or they can get like things on a memory stick and then watch these videos and learn English that way. So the internet is this very, very important medium, and we just right now are running the danger of losing it by putting it full of kittens and like, uh, and like five second videos of uh, GIFs of, of TV shows and we put like a text on top of that and we're amazingly clever. So the web as a platform we dreamed up is based on a few beautiful, simple principles. And these principles have not changed. Like Tim Berners-Lee, or Timbo as I call him whenever he comes around. <laughs> Uh, maintainability, like the thing has to be easy to be updated. Like when uh, it's not a fixed format, it's something that you change a text and the website is updated. And that's how easy it should be. And we're getting away from that a bit. Accessibility, it doesn't matter what computer you use, what, what, uh, what uh, connection you have. Even American connections are allowed, although they're not the fastest. Um, it doesn't matter if you're blind, if you can't see, if you only have three fingers, if you're ginger. Anybody's allowed on the internet and everybody should be, should be on there. Predictability. Like the web standards, we invented those things or we defined those things because we got sick of Internet Explorer 6 and Netscape 4 doing different things. Out of a sudden, we can build something and we know it's going to work across browsers. So that was the idea of, of a web standard in itself. Flexibility. Design was never meant to be in pixels. Uh, web design was never meant to be in pixels because screen sizes changed all the time. And nowadays, there's even no, no, uh, no screens anymore with IoT devices and so on and so forth. And extensibility. Whatever you build should be easy to extend. That's why we have CSS. That's why we didn't do look and feel in our HTML anymore, because if you change it in one place, it changes across the whole website. If you want to change the look and feel, you change one file. So these are the things that the web was built on. And these principles have always been challenged. They've been challenged by us, and they've been challenged by other people. Products don't start as service ideas or content, but as visuals. And that's the biggest problem. We get like a PowerPoint presentation. This is what the website should look like. Nobody says, like, here's our texts. Put some semantic HTML around it, which we would love to have, but nobody gets this kind of information. We get like printouts or like, here's what our print campaign was like, please make a website out of that. And that's not the right way approaching it. There's also a false belief in this should work, work and look the same everywhere. And this is not dying. People are really like, how can I make it work in that browser, pixel perfect like in that browser? It's really simple. Just make a screenshot of your website and release that one, but then nobody can interact <laughs> with it. And it's, even that doesn't scale, so it has, to, has color differences depending on which monitor that you're on. It's a flawed comparison with more defined specialized environments. The last few years, we lost a lot of our, uh, of our drive because we looked at native, we looked at mobile, and we was like, oh, the web cannot compete with that. And of course it cannot compete with that because it's built for one operating system in one device in one state. It's like a Formula One car. It's really, go, really good for driving Formula One, but going shopping with it and parking it in the parking lot is not the nicest and easiest thing to do. These are specialized environments, and a flexible environment cannot compete with them and should not, because it's better than that. And we don't have time for you for, to craft, just release this thing and fix it later. I mean, anybody here probably had a boss telling them that, like, yeah, we know it's terrible, but it has to go out now, and then we can build a client, and then later on we can ride unicorns and get ice cream, and everybody will be able to fix the things that you just hated. And that never happens, because we just go to the next project and we delete it from our CV because we don't want to be associated with that thing any longer. <laughs> the bigger problem is that we have internalized these challenges. We've become uh, like 
we have a preconception of like it will not work and the boss will be not understanding what I want to do and I will not be able to do creative stuff. That's why we get creative in our free time and we actually show off to each other on CodePen and we show off to each other on Hacker News rather than building things in our environment that we work in. So do we need to release more and faster all the time? I think not, but this is such an old concept of like built-in obsolescence of products. In the 1950s, they did that in America, so you sell more products. They realized if things don't break, people don't spend money. Let's make things that break. And then later on, we came up with fashion, like let's make things that look outdated so people buy new things. So the faster and new and the, the, the fetish of creating something new is very ingrained in our market, and we should be disruptive against that. Are we okay with building and discarding everything and, uh, over and over again? I'm not, but I think a lot of people are getting there. Like a lot of times you're like, okay, I'll use this framework now. And no, that's not good anymore. Let's use the other one. And are we just plumbers off the web or do we call the shots? Because I mean, I always love it when you, uh, I love this comparison. Like I, when it, sometimes as a web developer, I, I, I imagine like being a plumber and then people would come to me and say like, well, I want you to fix my house because I'm knee deep in water. Let's call it water. <laughs> and, um, I want you to use these rusty old pipes that I have because obviously these are still good, so please don't use your expert stuff because that's what you should be doing. So people keep telling us what we should be doing while they're paying us as experts to do the stuff for them. Whereas they don't understand what we're doing. So we should be totally like, no, we're experts, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not gonna work with bad products. As developers of the web, we live in a world of promises. A lot of it is just promises right now. Almost every new API that came out in the last year did not get released, but everybody got super excited on the first day. This is what we need to make the web work. The web already works. It works terribly because we put lots of crap on it, but it works. So every week or so, there's some new incredible technology to play with. Web components were a big thing. Service workers, ECMAScript 2015, 2016, WebVR, WebGL, WebRTC. All of these things are super exciting. And I worked in, in, on Firefox, and I worked on Edge, and I worked on all these things. And I'm like, oh, this is cool stuff. And then I tried to get people to use it. And they're like, well, it's behind a flag, and it does this. And it's, it's not that easy yet. But all these things are exciting and incredible. But if you define incredible, then you actually see that it means impossible to believe which a lot of the things are. Like a lot of the stuff like, this is the future that you need to do right now because our browser should be the first one to do it because we want you to go to our search engine or something like that. I'm not naming any names here. <laughs> and I think it's, we, all of these things are lacking credibility because all of these things are, in essence, experimental. And experimental things is when things blow up. It's when people die, it's when, when scientists breed dinosaurs that eat people and things. So experimental is not for production, but we still get very excited about all the experiments that we're doing right now. Many things need non-standard code and flags to be turned on. Like, okay, either you have a prefix on your CSS or you have to turn on the flag or you have to get the latest nightly build of a browser. Who's got time for that? Not our end users, not us. We're not guinea pigs of that stuff. We wanna be on the bleeding edge, that's fine. But it's like, if we use a different browser than our end users, that messes up our testing heavily. That's a really bad idea to me. Things work only in one browser, sometimes even a special build, and that's like the, you need IE6 and 800 by 600 resolution to see this website. We made that mistake. Let's not make that mistake again. Then we get impatient, and then that's why we build abstractions. So we wanna have all the cool service worker stuff and web component stuff, and so we build abstraction libraries. And then like, oh, just use this library and it works. And then use this library as well, and that library as well, and that library as well, and out of a sudden we get this massive thing of things we don't understand. We make these more reusable, we base them on other libraries, packages, and frameworks. The other day I got a basic website, a single website, uh, for a conference, and I downloaded it from GitHub, and I'm like, I wanted to, I wanted to edit it, and then I'm like, okay, npm install something, okay, it has its own server, fair enough. And it was 17 minutes on my two gigabit connection at home. And like, it was like 320 meg of like 37,000 files for one static HTML page. That's where we are right now because everything becomes so much more usable that way. <laughs> and almost every single one of these comes with a long website, beautiful documentation, a logo, and then at the end of it, it says, don't use this in production. <laughs> you know, it's like buying a DVD and then you open it, there's no DVD in there. Like, but we gave you all the things that the DVD has in it. It's like, why do we build things that don't, don't use in production? We can blow up things in production. We do it all the time. So just use awesome source JS and it's gone. 
because we, every week there's like a new library that fixes everything. And when, I, when I'm on the road and I don't have time to look at it and then I look at it and then by the time I look at it two days later, there's the first blog post. This is not good for use. Don't use that. And I feel inadequate. I feel like I'm old. I don't catch up anymore. This is too fast. What am I doing here? It's like maybe I should go into goat farming or something like that. <laughs> so who do we innovate for if we can't use it in production? And I think it's just ourselves, really, because we're so self-conscious that our bosses don't know what we're doing, that we're actually inventing things for ourselves so our peers who understand our problems can pat our back and say, like, that is awesome, rather than like our end users getting real products that are, that are better than before. And we have great jobs. We shouldn't feel unhappy or stressed. My brother's a fireman. Half my family is unemployed. And uh, it's just, when I come back on Christmas, I feel so terrible because I, get, I complain that we only have like 12 different free snacks in the office. <laughs> you know, and, and, and people are complaining about like, oh yeah, well, we don't have this and that, and they get that perk and whatever. Things do not burn when we make mistakes, most of us. I mean, if we work in hospitals and stuff, please write good code. But uh, um, <laughs> most of the time, it's like five pixels off. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's have, have, going to have a problem with that. The environment we work in flows like water. There's a constant need for new ideas. I've been a web developer for 17 years, I think. Well, longer than that, 1997, I did my first intranet for BMW. And I need to learn all the time new things, but I didn't need them to, oh god, jump on this and replace all the others. I just made my craft better by, by finding new best practices. And best practices are found, they're not defined. You, your best practice in your company might be a different one to another company. We need to be the masters of uncertainty. Nothing on the web is a given. The end users can mess with our products any way they want to, and that's the web. Let's just deal with that. That's like you cannot tell people what to use. We work in a publication medium, not a software platform. I was a radio journalist before I found the internet, and I dropped my job. I did my first website because I can now publish worldwide without spending money. How cool is that? Chinese people can read my stuff without me sending it in a, in a tape over by mail or something like that, and I'd even understand them because I can translate things that they sent me. It's time to be more responsible for our work. And that doesn't mean you have to be on the bleeding edge and you have to be innovative. It just means love your work, work much more, and do better things. Always question authority. That's like Nurse Ratched in like uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or anybody else. Like browser innovation, question that stuff. And I, I'm, I'm telling all of them, if Microsoft comes up with stuff, question it. If Firefox comes up with stuff, question it. If Google comes up with stuff, question it. If Safari comes up with stuff, you're surprised. So browser innovation is important, but we shouldn't just be the guinea pigs of browser makers. We shouldn't just say, like, OK, if nobody else is going to implement that, why should I spend extra effort on one browser? Because there's never only one browser out there. Standards not implemented in browsers is the same issue. XHTML was this like, idea or this academic thing that nobody uses. The W3C is full of these standards that nobody ever implemented that are really not necessary. So sometimes the standard questioning is good as well. Magical abstractions, this library does everything for you. OK, what is the maintenance schedule of that library? Will I be able to use that in a year's time, or will the developer be bored and actually be just another GitHub repository with 6,000 pull requests that nobody answers? Impressive looking tool chains and development packages are great. They make us look like more professional developers. But I'd rather tell somebody this is what CSS does, not like go to the terminal, install Ruby, install, install less, start developing by going to the terminal. We went away from the 70s where we only had terminals. We have better computers now. So we should be actually better in development as well. Blind faith and abstractions and browser innovation led to a terrible state of the web. And it's that, uh, it, the web is terrible right now. The average website is two megabyte with 100 requests. After like all the conferences we gave about performance, I were telling people what to do, and all of these things are just like bloated, and people put more and more stuff in because stuff and reasons. And uh, I was in Albania the other day, and my mobile, uh, my English connection was uh, roaming. And it was 10 megabyte, cost me 12 pound. So an average website would cost me about $7 to look at. The page, not the site, the first page load. It better be a good website for that. And it probably wasn't, because I didn't do it, because I'm not stupid. <laughs> I think we shouldn't allow scapegoats to get in our way. And when I talked about HTML5 in the last few years, about uh, from Firefox OS and all the, the stuff that we did in, in, uh, in Mozilla, I always got one answer, oh, I would love to do the stuff that you're doing right now, but I got to support Internet Explorer. And that was like our big enemy. And like we know it's probably made with like blueprints that Hitler wrote in the 40s, and then they made the browser out of it. <laughs> like, 
we, we all saw the Microsoft guys in their rooms cackling away like, ah, oh, if we break this, we're going to mess with people's developers' time. Yeah, that's going to be good. <laughs> make that thing, make that box model different to everybody else. That's going to be good. <laughs> so I wanted, to help, uh, I wanted to help the web, and that's why I went and worked for Microsoft. I joined Microsoft to help with a one very important fix, and that is Internet Explorer is dead. Microsoft Edge is now the browser in Windows 10. It comes out of the box as the browser. There's still an Internet Explorer in there if you use like internal websites, but you have to opt into actually getting them rendered this way, because otherwise we wouldn't have any booking systems in Microsoft, because a lot of our own websites don't run in Edge. But it is an HTML5 compliant browser. It's a beautiful browser. It was written from scratch, and that we thought was the right thing. The plan was really simple. Burn IE and let a new browser emerge from the ashes. Sounds familiar? Yes. <laughs> That's how Firefox started as well. And then we basically realized we get rid of all the bad ideas of the past. Get rid of all the things that were in Internet Explorer that nobody ever wanted, like VML, attach event, current style, VB script, conditional comments, the different rendering modes, all the things that was IE only is now gone. And it's beautiful to see developers deleting code. You know, when they're like, I wanted to get rid of this for years and years, and I can now do it. Look at that, it's gone. Like, and it's so inspiring to see that, because we always want to clean up stuff, but we never get allowed to. We were too late, though. Releasing an HTML5 compliant browser nowadays should be the thing, right? The browser idea is that the browser doesn't matter. The end user's interface of the browser is how we should compete on. The rendering engine should do the same thing across browsers. That's why we define standards. That's the whole idea of a standard. I do not have to have 12, 12 different browsers on my computer just to be a web developer. I should be writing against something, and it would work. So we got rid of 200, 000, uh, 220,000 lines of code, uh, six document modes, 600 APIs that nobody needed except for Windows developers. And then we replaced them with 300K of unique lines of code with 55 new standards. All the stuff that is in HTML5, all the thing that people always said, like, if I only had that, I could make better things. And then we found 4,200 interop problems. What does that mean? You go on the web and you get this result. This is Safari, this is Firefox, this is Internet Explorer Mobile. Same website, three different look, three different look and feels. Because people do user agent sniffing. They detect, oh, it's a Safari, you're probably a mobile, I give you the beautiful things. Oh, it's actually Internet Explorer, I give you the things because I want to punish you. <laughs> Never trust a user agent. We found this test string. Somebody tested for if this is a mobile device or not. So take a, take a moment and write it down if you want to. <laughs> The irony was that, uh, uh, that mobile, uh, uh, mobile Internet Explorer did not get caught by that. So it's like, you're not a mobile. And I'm like, look, I'm one, and it really works out. User agent sniffing is evil and terrible, and, but we still do it. And most of the time, we do it because we try to fix a layout problem for two hours. And then like, you know what? Sod it. I'm just going to put, put a thing in there and not give a layout to that browser. But the problem with that is you give it to that browser and to the browser that follows it where that problem has been fixed. So if you do user agent sniffing, at least do it with a number as well, not just with the name of the browser. It was funny when, Internet, when Firefox became Firefox 10, and then out of a sudden we got all the layouts for Firefox 1, because people just tested for one number in the user agent. <laughs> That's why it's Windows 10 and not Windows no, no. <laughs> Experimental CSS, we're like, remember, experimental is when things blow up and kitten get, kittens get slapped and things. Like, experimental is not a good thing. But we find, for example, this kind of stuff. WebKit appearance is used by almost every website we found. And we ran the Bing crawler. So it's like 42 million websites. And uh, any other browser doesn't have WebKit appearance, of course, so it doesn't do anything. This was a dating site where if you have, uh, if you have WebKit appearance, then it shows you male or female. If you don't have WebKit appearance, then you're either an empty or a selected radio button. <laughs> Maybe it's just there to get people more creative in their dating. I don't know. Like, hey, this month I'm going to be a full radio button. I, I don't know. <laughs> but this stuff happens, and it annoys me because it didn't even have labels on it. You know, having a label, male or female, next to it, if the thing hadn't shown up, fine. It still would be working. But no, it's just now it's unusable. Same with gradients. Gradients normally, in this case, just look and feel. But they, we found so many white buttons with white background because people just stood WebKit gradient as the background without a fallback color. And that's so simple to do. So. 
we found that out that, this, that, that people are lazy about this, so we had to put a lot of interoperability issues into the browser. So we had to do WebKit prefixes into Microsoft Edge, and we felt dirty, and we had to be washed every two days, and like, hard for engineer. But we were just like, this is not right, but we have to do it, and uh, Firefox will be the other one that has to do it because people have been using this stuff that was experimental in production. More interesting even when, you've, when you build a JavaScript engine, there's a great talk by Brian Terrison and Gaura Seth, my colleagues, about a Chakra engine. So if you're into JavaScript and JIT compilation and like geeky stuff about byte compilation, that's a really good talk. And uh, we found some interesting bits there as well. Only a third of the top 3,000 sites can benefit from JS inlining. The reason is that lots of script instead of concatenation. People have lots of script elements and, and include jQuery from here, bootstrap from there, this from there, this from there. Which in a CDN makes sense, but every HTTP request is a terrible thing. So we told people for years and years, concatenate your JavaScript. What does JS inlining mean? So you have a JavaScript function that calls another function. The JS compiler has to turn each of those into bytecode. So if they turn each of those into bytecode, you have double the RAM, you have double the, uh, uh, the, the memory consumption, you have double the slowness. So when we find a function calling another function, we pull that function inside the other one and then make just one bytecode out of it. That is what inlining is, and every browser does that. But it cannot do it if it's, a, it's, if it's across different script includes, and even worse when it's across different domains, because then you get a security problem, because you cannot just inline code from one domain into another. So stop using lots and lots of includes and use a grunt, gulp, burp, fart, or whatever the things are called nowadays to actually make one file out of all your JavaScript. You need to optimize a lot of JavaScript in the engine. Length reading on every iteration of loops is still a thing. You know, for i equals zero, i equals array length, uh, i plus plus. That, that's just basic programming. Like, when the length does not change of that array, why do you read it on every iteration? So now the JavaScript engine goes through every for loop, analyzes what's in the for loop, and then turns it into bytecode. So we optimize these things for you, but we had to because people just did it all the time and it slowed down the engine. And every time when something is slow, the first thing we complain is that the browser is broken. The same way when I suck at a computer game, I always tell the programmer of the computer game wasn't good until I got used to writing, playing that game and I get better and I apologize to them. Outdated libraries are still very much in use and clash with new JavaScript features. Like, uh, for example, J array contains in the ES6 standard had to be renamed because MooTools in an older version had array contains in it and all these sites broke. We cannot break the web as browsers. That's what we cannot do. But we, we have to jump through hoops to make it happen. Zepto had a problem with array constructors. So the new array constructors in ES6 didn't work because people used Zepto. And we tried to email them, we tried to ask people to upgrade it, but a lot of them are projects that have been sold to a client and can never get touched again because the client doesn't want to pay for any of the changes. Minification, on the other hand, is used a lot on the web. So that's good, that's great. Uglify.js is almost used everywhere, so almost every JavaScript engine optimizes for making Uglify.js code faster. So things I learned for working for browser makers as well, because we always blame the browser makers, like, oh, these guys, like, you don't do the innovation that we do. I want to have rotating hippos and these kind of things. Everybody should have that natively. It's a constant race not to break the web. Every single mistake we as web developers make, and I wrote a, a lot of mistakes. I, I, I wrote a lot of stuff on the web that should not be there, gets catered for because browsers cannot break backwards compatibility. Because if you bring out a new browser and the website does look, doesn't look right, people complain and go back to the other browser. And we love to tell browser makers, I use Chrome. Whenever I work for Firefox, people are like, I, I'm sorry, I use Chrome. And I'm like, I'm sorry you had to tell me that. It's really terrible. Your suffering is horrible. Like, I don't care what browser you use as long as you use a modern one. <laughs> like, I really do not give to, oh no. <clears throat> the pressure is immense. The competition between browsers and the like, you know, browser stats coming out every month. This browser lost so much, that browser gained so much. You cannot detect browsers properly. All these stats are bollocks. None of them make any sense. But we get very excited when Internet Explorer loses two points and Chrome gets up five points. Like, I don't care. Features is what we need, not different browsers. Instead of pushing an interoperable web, browsers are constantly compared and expected to be different. Like, oh, Google innovated that. What is your innovation this month? And you're like, what, you want more? You want more things that you cannot use today? No, you want <laughs> things that actually work for your end users. When implementing standards, we find a lot of problems and feed them back. That's why a score of 100% in feature tests makes no sense. 
Like in ES6 compliance tests, Edge is now the, the leading browser with the most of the features. But a lot of the ES6 features we couldn't include. That's why we didn't reach 100% because they broke with different libraries. So we actually had to go back to the spec writers to get them changed or rename them or something or, or alias them and these kind of things. So the whole 100% thing, like HTML5test.com, half these features are not used by people. Like app cache was a great thing. Jake Archibald gave this great talk about that app cache is a naughty word. And uh, then everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, app cache was always terrible. I never used it. And uh, I tried to use it so many times. And then we went to the Bing crawler. 0.02% of websites out there have an app cache. Nobody used app cache, but everybody wrote massive blog posts and talks about it, how broken that thing is. So it's not, we don't know even that how broken it is because you didn't use it. You just repeated what other people said. Most speed increases are based on analyzing and fixing developer mistakes and sloppiness, which is actually pretty cool, but actually kind of sad that we, we cannot innovate the engine, but we have to optimize it for bad things in the past. But at least something good came out of a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. We're stuck in a loop of demand and flawed supply. We like these, these, these greedy kids of new technology that are like, oh, browser should do this, browser should do this, libraries should do that. We want to do this on the web. We innovate the web by making it parallax and like really annoying and scrolly and then with a, a made with love and so-and-so in the footer. <laughs> and now we need to concentrate on one, getting one thing right, and that is ES6. And we're going to have other talks about that today. And ES6 is a watershed moment to me because uh, for the first time, uh, JavaScript has become incompatible with, with the older browsers. We changed the syntax, and everything in ES6 is a syntax error in older browsers. And that, to me, sounds like a weird one, but it's also a good opportunity. Like, we can, we can, we can draw a line in the sand and say, like, okay, this is an ES6 thing. We don't give JavaScript to any other browser. I don't mind if you don't give JavaScript to Internet Explorer 6. Give it to HTML and CSS that works. It's a, it's a retired browser. It should be on, on the beach or, or like angling with other browsers. Or don't give it things that annoy it. Don't, don't give IE6 users beautiful interfaces. They're not used to that. It would just confuse them. <laughs> so ES6 comes with so much goodness, it technically has to be fattening. And uh, all of these things are for different audiences. There's syntactic sugar in JavaScript now that you have arrow functions and template strings, these kind of things. There's things for scalable apps like let constant block scoping for bindings so you don't have the whole memory leaking anymore. You've got classes so you can actually build much, things much, much bigger. And then for library builders, we have lots of stuff in there like proxy symbols, subclassable build-ins. So ES6 uh, tries to cater to a lot of people. And uh, that's why don't get frustrated when, as a normal JavaScript developer who does just rollovers or things like that, you're like, oh my god, what is all that stuff? It's not all for you. You don't have to know everything. That's what, uh, to me, a good web developer, you always were a librarian. You didn't have to know everything, but you had to know where to find the right resource and use it on demand. The support is encouraging, but also patchy. Red is bad in this case. So that's a different browsers and different compilers and stuff. And it's a great website uh, upgraded by that Kangax guy. And he, he keeps that up to date all the time. It's great to see. The problem, as I said before, for non-supporting browsers, ES6 features are syntax errors. And that's a terrible thing, because JavaScript, when it fails, it's, not, uh, it's basically not fault tolerant. HTML and CSS are fault tolerant. Run CSS line, browser, meh, OK, go to the next line, do the next thing. JavaScript, oh my god, I'm, uh, I'm house is on fire. I'm not going to do anything anymore. And that's why relying on JavaScript for your website is a very, 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 very stupid idea. We got rid of XHTML because one unencoded ampersand would make sure that the website cannot be shown anymore. And we're like, oh, we cannot punish our end users. And now we do it with JavaScript. <laughs> and JavaScript has even more options to fail, like proxies and like all kind of uh, clashes in JavaScript libraries. It turns out you can feature test I.O. There's feature tests.io. Uh, you can feature test ES6. There's feature tests I.O., which allows you to, it's a little library to put in, and it says, like, this browser supports these features of ES6, and then you can start using them. That's a pretty cool idea as well, because then you never give code to browsers that don't understand it. If you want to use it, though, then you transpile it. That's the big thing about ES6 right now. Babel.js, or you, you, you write in TypeScript, or you used to write in CoffeeScript, and then it turns it into ES5. So every browser now gets the cool code that you've written in ES6. And the ES6 code is much, much nicer to write. It's terser. It gives you a better vocabulary. It's basically like Oxford English rather than like Southern slang in JavaScript. The problem with transpiling, of course, is that it makes it more complex and adds an extra step in between writing code and running it in the browser. I always love that I write code, save, 
command reload, done, and I see what's going on there. Now, transpilation in between, waiting, compiling, getting for a coffee, learning a new language, getting a degree, coming back, and then seeing that my code runs. And uh, I think the, the immediacy, especially, there's a lot of people here teaching code as well. The immediacy showing kids like, okay, you put that in there and now it works, that's a great thing. Like, oh, please set up these 10,000 things first before you're allowed to say that, eh, not so much. You don't run or debug the code you write. That's the other big problem. So debuggers in browsers are incredible, but when you actually transpile, you're, you're, you're running the, the, the ES5 code and you have to debug that one. So you have to source map everything back to the code that you wrote, that generated that code, and it's kind of a mess. And especially, it's like, it doesn't matter how you optimize your ES6 code, just because the code generated is the one that you have no insight into. You had the mercy of the transpiler to create efficient code. And that probably is good. Tran uh, uh, Babel is an amazing piece of software, and they do a lot of stuff to optimize the ES5 code. But you probably write much more code than you need. And that's the same with CSS pre-processing. Uh, pre like, oh, look, it's four lines of less or four lines of SAS. And you're like, yeah, it's 670 lines of CSS that is completely unmaintainable. And if people don't know it came from SAS, then they start messing with that one. And browsers, that's my biggest problem. Browsers that support ES6 will never get any ES6 that way. Because we want to use the new functionality right now. We convert it into the old functionality under the hood. So what we do in browsers is more or less useless because we never get the ES6 code. It's just for the browser itself, it makes sense. Like writing inside developer tools in ES6 is much, much easier than writing uh, just in JavaScript. So how does ES6 perform? That's another nice website about this. Everything that is not dark green or like darkish green is slower than uh, ES5. And the amazing finding here is that the features that are only supported in ES6 are faster than ES5. All the others are not. <laughs> but that's a normal thing. We made the language more complex. We put new things in, so it will get slower. The only problem is we cannot make it faster because we never get that code into the browser. So we cannot optimize for it right now. So we're in a, in a conundrum. And I'm gonna, uh, there's going to be an article coming out of this in two days in SidePoint that I wrote about this. We cannot use ES6 safely in the wild. Like, we, browsers don't understand it. No, not a single browser has full, full support. Most of them have partial, partial support. Older browsers don't get anything at all. We can use TypeScript to transpile it. We can feature test for it, but it can get complex very quickly. Like, how many feature tests do you want? I want to use arrow function, this and that, and then if, 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 if. Not good either. Also, people do feature tests for one feature and then assume that there's support for another feature, and that's a very dangerous assumption as well. Browsers that support it will not get any ES6 that way, but can use it internally, so that's good. The performance is bad right now. It's a normal thing. To improve this, we need ES6 to be used in the wild. We cannot use it in the wild, but we need it to get used in the wild. So that's the big problem that we have right now. So that's why I said it's a watershed moment. So if you want to go into ES6, probably think about other environments as well. Think about Node. Think about writing applications in JavaScript inside other. I mean, everything right now. I mean, like the uh, 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 Visual Studio code is written in JavaScript. That's pretty awesome. You know, like your JavaScript editor written in JavaScript, and like it's complete, like getting confusing, but good. You can help ES6 by looking at unit tests. There is uh, the ECMAScript uh, uh, standard body has put the unit tests for ES6 on GitHub. And you can look at them and help us, because that's what browsers and transpilers use to support ES6. This is boring as toast. So we actually did another thing called es6katas.org. It's by the, by the guys from Uxibo in Germany. And uh, there, there you can actually get, look at one unit test per day and learn ES6 that way by reviewing the unit test. So that's pretty cool. You basically, you, you learn by doing and helping out the standards body to get ES6 out of the ground. And I think we should go, let's go back to a good principle of HTML5 design. And that was in the HTML5 specification. In case of conflict, consider users over authors, over implementers, over specifiers, over theoretical purity. purity. As it's a standard, of course, it's a short and terse sentence that's really easy to understand. But what it means is like, we build shit for people and not for ourselves. And our end users should never suffer for what we do. And we keep them, make them suffer right now with lots of code that they don't need, with lots of libraries that make the website bloated, with lots of assumptions like, well, you don't have Chrome, so you're not good enough for our website, these kind of things. We, we make people suffer all the time. Well, suffer, punish them. And we live on too many empty promises. There's always this carrot at the end of the stick that like, oh, the future will be here in a second. Tooling will save us in a lot of cases, but we shouldn't have to counter bad decisions in the past with more code. A lot of the tooling that we do, a lot of the pre-processing, a lot of the stuff is like, 
okay, you use 6,000 includes in your CSS, now we actually compile that for you together into a single file because obviously you need these 6,000 includes. Take a look at what you're doing up front. Like a lot of stuff is undoing bad things we did to the browser with another tool. And that just makes it more complex because when you hand it over to somebody else, they have to understand that tool as well. I said grunt gulp earlier, these kind of things. All of a sudden I have to learn that rather than like feature tests I owe. It looks terrible. So I offered Kyle to basically write a better CSS and make it beautiful. And I downloaded it from him and he got me access to his GitHub account and then I started Okay, it's, it's Node.js based, so it has a server. Okay, fine enough, running Node.js. Oh no, it's actually I.O. and it's an experimental build, so you have to download that one first before, and I'm like, you know, I gave you an hour of my time, which is very expensive. I'm not getting an hour of your time to learn your experimental build of I.O. I wanna help you with your CSS. And if your CSS is not static CSS for a single website, that should be very simple, then probably we're, we're getting too excited about our tools, rather than like the end goal of what we wanna build for people. It's great and necessary that browsers innovate at different speeds, but unless that innovation lands in all of them, it is dangerous to use. And that's of course a big problem with Safari, because all the other browsers, we always know what's coming. Safari is just this black hole of like, yay, let's go WWDC, and two weeks later we learn about what's gonna come in the next Safari. And of course we got the problem with Android having the browser hardwired to the operating system and every mobile phone provider coming out with their own browser and turning off things and turning on things, so it's kind of tricky. But we, we should actually push for more interoperability. And that's where I'm counting on you to go to browsers and say like, that's lovely, but how about we get these form elements in HTML5 sorted across browsers? Why do I have to use a jQuery drop, drop down because it looks awful across different browsers and cannot be styled? Not everything that solves a problem has to become a generic solution. Going generic always comes with bloat. And that's a fetish we have as developers. As developers, we love to build things that do things for us. So when we write code, we make it then generic, so everybody running into the same problem can use our code as well, but they never do. They just write their own thing because they're disagreeing with one thing that we did in our generic solution. So generic code is a beautiful idea, but I think we have too many libraries and too many complex libraries. Making micro-optimization and writing code for the project right now that does the thing right now and is properly documented is better because then you can come later and extend that thing. And rather than like, there's a generic solution now, you have to learn that other syntax that converts into another syntax because terser and much easier to read. I disagree, it's like, uh, my, my, my Twitter handle is CodePoet because I think code is really poetry, it's writing. It's not, it's not algorithms, it's not math. It's like finding a solution to a problem in different ways. And uh, generic solutions give us like this, this is our solution and no, nothing else works. And we have too many parallel ones of those. We won't achieve much with punishment. Our end users should never have to change the environment because of our code. Of our web developer code, that is stupid to assume. Security updates, these kind of things, definitely. Like IE6 has to die, Windows XP has to go away. I totally agree with that. But that you tell people, you're, you're not good enough for my website, that's just arrogant and that's just stupid as well because you will end up in a holiday in some internet cafe with a computer that you don't want to even touch because it's so virus written and you basically will have an old browser there and you still have to print out your tickets for your, for your airline or something like that. You will run into these environments. Blaming the tool is a sign of a bad craftsman. Good craftsmen improve the tools and feeding back to the tool maker. Like, oh my God, we, this would only be better if browsers wouldn't suck. File a report. Tell us what was the problem. Tell us how we can fix it. And go to the bug trackers of every browser and do it there. Don't go on Twitter and complain that browsers should do something because engineers are too busy for that. They're actually on the bug tracker going through a list of 6,000 things that they have to fix. So if your bug comes in there, then they will fix it. If you put it on Twitter, you just cause chaos and you let people grandstand themselves and, and throw mud at each other and stuff. It's not your fault. If you think it's too fast what's happening right now, if you look at Hacker News and you're like, oh my God, all these cool kids use this amazing stuff, and I do, I'm not stupid, I think. Um, we just like to show off to each, to, too much to each other. We just like to make solutions, generic solutions that solve every problem because obviously our operating system and browser makers are not real programmers and needs a JavaScript guy to fix the stuff for them. We get too excited about innovating for ourselves and it should be not something that we get stressed by. I think love and passion trumps everything. And I think you should love responsibly, always. And uh, in this case, I think everything you do is for our end users. Great UX is invisible. I, I, I always feel bad for people that do great UX because 
the stuff just works and people like, well, yeah, it works. That's the obvious thing, you know, but the obvious thing took like 12 months of research and user testing and these kind of things. The more your interface is intuitive, the more work went into it. And it should be the same with code. Our code issues should be invisible to the end user. They should never get an error message. They should never be punished and say like, oh, that doesn't work because you don't have that cool feature in your browser. Good code is invisible and does the thing in the background. What you use and makes you happy is not what other users have. These things? Holy cow. I mean, in some countries I was, people spend six months of wage on that. And we're like, yeah, but this is two years old. I've got to get a new one now. That's terrible. You know, like the amount of people that, that are at open source conferences with very closed source hardware is immense to me, you know? It's like what we have, our internet connectivity, our computers, our screens, our keyboards, our abilities is not what people have out there. Go and look at hospitals, go and look at universities, go and look into offices and what people are using, and remember this is your audience. It's painful, but it is the people that actually bring us the money, pay us the money, and pay our jobs. These are the people that click on ads. We all have ad blockers installed, because we're clever. You know, These are the people that click on ads and make our money, so pay some respect to them. If you love the web, keep it clean. If don't get excited and like, oh my god, I don't know this, I want to learn in this JavaScript library that tomorrow will be gone. Instead, go through some old code and remove it. If your boss doesn't know what you're doing for a while and he's like, he thinks you're coding on the project, just remove stuff from old projects that is bad. It feels incredibly good. It feels amazingly good, like, oh my god, I just cheated my boss into doing something useful. <laughs> and it just makes it very exciting to, to actually be a developer again. And if people like you who created things that annoy you. Like, uh, explain your issue, ask for reasons, and you see fixes. Like, people that, that build things that you don't like, uh, and you, you just basically like, oh my god, that's obviously stupid on Twitter. It's not stupid. There's reasons why bad code exists. So talk to these people and find out what drove them to write that very, very stupid code. And in many cases, you will find out that there were good reasons for it. And you would be a very unkind person showing off publicly on Twitter and telling them that they're not good developers. It's always easy to look at the final product and find two flaws and point them out and win, win Twitter for five minutes. You know. That's not what we should be doing, because we all do the same things. We're all developers. We all want to do something good for the web. And especially browser makers and library makers want to make the web work. And when something is not in there, ask for reasons why it's not in there. Don't just say, like, oh, it should be in there and keep repeating it. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on on Twitter right now. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Like, ask for features in browsers by keep repeatedly pinging them and stuff. It's true, but if the, if the wheel keeps squeaking after you gave it oil, then you replace it and the squeaky mouse gets the cat. So don't just shout about things. Go where it really can change something. And good things take time. I think it's time for us to slow down. It's time for us to slow down, reflect what we're doing, and build things that really make sense. Build real products with new functionality in them. Don't build demos of new functionality. They will never come. And that's all I had. So love what you do. Do what you love. Thank you very much. <laughs>